Welcome to the GeoTop seminar. Today's speaker will be Prof Professor Heather Harrington from the University of Oxford, whom we're very happy to welcome to the seminar. And she will speak on Introduction to Algebraic Systems Biology. Heather? Thank you very much for the invitation to speak about um, applications of geometry and topology. So I'd like to give kind of an overview of some of the problems we've been looking at um, to study systems biology. So um, before I go into the oh, before I go into the details, I'd first like to acknowledge that um, the main biological problem that I've been that I'm going to talk about today is work um, that I started discussing with Stas Schwarzman in 2011, and then I spent some time at Princeton in 2013. And um, after many experiments, now um, I have we have some results in that direction. So it's actually data that I'm going to talk about is from the lab of Stas and um, Martin's lab, and then the main um, experimentalists that have done the work are Sarah and Ian. And then on the theoretical side, there's many mathematicians and statisticians that have um, kind of contributed to different parts of what I'm going to talk about today. So I'm trying to kind of overview um, many different aspects of uh, algebra, geometry, and topology that arise in systems biology. So um, here's a long list, but uh, the two people that have um, kind of driven a lot of this is Emily Dufresne, who's a commutative algebraist that's an expert in separating invariants, and she's at York, and uh, Lewis Marsh, who is a DPhil student here in Oxford. Okay, so uh, first, just because I know at the end I always feel rushed, I'm uh, acknowledging um, all this, um, all the people that I've been working with. So, okay, so let's start. Um, what is systems biology? So if we look at these two cells here, um, and then we zoom in, uh, we can see there's many different molecules, and it's beautiful watercolors by David Goodsell, where he's painted each of these different molecules in the cell, and they have often many roles, but one of them is if we zoom in to these different blobs, uh, one of the things that we're very interested in systems biology is how systems of molecules actually interact. So if we think about um, many drug targets in pharmaceuticals, um, many of the, the targets they develop, um, these drugs actually uh, would are some type of signaling molecule. It's um, you have a, a ligand that binds to a receptor. So these is numbered one and two, for example. And then uh, through that binding, some information um, is exchanged, and so then there may be some protein um, membrane-bound proteins that um, that perform different biological functions, and ultimately through uh, signaling, you have three, four, five, six here, and then um, different molecular interactions ultimately happen, and uh, then some of these molecules. So this molecule 11 happens to be um, the one of the molecules I'll talk a lot about today, um, 10 and 11, and um, and then they go into the nucleus, and that is where genes are turned on or off, and that regulates cell decisions. And uh, one of the challenges is it's often difficult to know exactly what are the molecules that are interacting. And um, so when we study these systems, one kind of um, biological um, object, so to speak, is called a signaling pathway. And that is a set of molecules and their interactions. And as I was saying, we don't often always know what those interactions are. So what we can do is model those system of reactions, as the system of interactions as biochemical reactions. And so these biochemical reactions, um, there are a certain number of, of um, 
a molecule, for example, or a species or a variable, I'm going to interchange species or variable, say xj, um, and there may be like 2x, 2, I don't know, 2x, 1 plus 3x, 2, and at some rate, ki, these are called rate constants, they form some other um, chemical species. So from this set of R reactions and N species or variables, we then get a system of chemical reactions. And from this system of chemical reactions, there are many ways to take this chemical um, reaction network and model it. And so one way is through creating a system of polynomial differential equations. And the way that we create this model, assuming mass action kinetics, and mass action kinetics is that you have um, what, um, you assume everything is well mixed, and then the reaction re occurs proportional to your reaction rate. So this Ki is a rate constant. So this is, these are parameters. And so when you're writing your system of ODEs, you have your um, stoichiometric coefficients. So you have the product, coef um, so you have reactants and products. And so then you have the product minus the reactant of that stoichiometric coefficient multiplied by your reaction rate, Ki, this um, rate constant or parameter, times your, the, this is how we write, the lowercase x is our concentrations. So x to the ri, where ri is each of these reactants here. So if we have, let me just give you an example. So if we look at um, 3x, oh, 3x um, at a rate k2 forms y plus 2z, we would look at what's on the left-hand side. So we have x and then um, raised to the 3. So this is the exponent that's um, corresponding to this. So then when we're looking at, for example, the change in y, for this reaction, we would see that um, y increases because we see that we have, um, it forms one y here. So that's k2 times x to the 3. We can similarly look at, um, well, so we have a system of four reactions, and that gives a, um, that gives a system of, um, because it's three species, of three um, coupled ODEs. So that's um, that. And then um, from this chemical reaction network, uh, there's kind of a vibrant area. So in the 70s, go through some of the history, Horn, Jackson, and Feinberg kind of um, developed a field and introduced invariants um, called uh, what's the deficiency of a network. So there's a whole deficiency theory, and this classifies a network into um, different possible uh, dynamical behaviors. And so that was the start of the field. And then Eduardo Sontag wrote a really beautiful paper, which has then kind of spun off um, many different uh, directions in, in uh, mathematical biology from the kinetic proof reading. And this is um, an example where now people are looking at um, T cells with um, where you have kind of um, a chain of, and what's nice is that they all, uh, the dif it's deficiency zero, which means that there's basically no interesting behavior. You can have multiple um, roots. Uh, and then Eduardo, uh, and then Jeremy gunner um kind of revitalized the field and explained um, a lot of uh, Feinberg's work um, in, in a kind of more accessible way to algebraists. And then George Krasian and Anne Shu and many others have worked towards um, uh, proving the global attractor conjecture kind of in different um, assumptions. And then George has um, presented a proof um, uh, recently. And so now people are looking at many different types of behaviors. If the chemical reaction network can have oscillations, if it can have multiple steady states, so this is multiple positive real zeros, and then um, there's been quite a bit of work uh, looking now at stoch stochastic uh, 
versions of chemical reaction network theory and these chemical reaction networks, which I'm going to talk about in a deterministic, not a stochastic setting. Um, then there's been work that um, called absolute, absolute concentration robustness, and this is where your the value of your steady state of, of the, um, the zero, the solution, does not change even if you change um, the parameter value. So, and uh, we have some some um, result re kind of recent results in that direction. And then finally, um, Alicia Dickenstein has a really beautiful um, kind of invitation of chemical reaction hour theory for um, algebraic geometers. And and kind of um, from this uh, work, there's um, also, you know, Elisenda Filou and Alicia Dickinson are working on a book, and there's a review that uh, Matthew, Matthew uh, McCauley and Nora Youngs is right. So this is still very vibrant. And so for, um, I guess I want to just kind of summarize that there's basically two ways that one can analyze. Um, I mean, there's many, but there's two um, main areas um, or directions for analyzing these chemical reaction networks. The first is to look at the left-hand side and the right-hand side of your chemical reaction network as chemical equations, right? So the left-hand side are the reactants, as I said, and the right-hand side are the products. And if we think of the left-hand side here as um, as a, a, a vert, uh, as, as the vertices of your graph, so you can think of x plus y is one vertex and 2x is another one, then, then these... Um, then what we have is a directed graph. So you have um, this digraph, and you can study um, uh, properties of this using the Laplacian. And there's many results that really focus on the structure of this chemical reaction network and what people can. Um, so that's kind of one area is more the graph um, graph theoretic uh, analysis, and it's really powerful at precluding certain behaviors. And and then the other direction, um, which is uh, just so I'm going to very briefly talk about today is when you're looking at setting the left-hand side of these polynomial um, dynamical system, the left-hand side equal to zero. And, uh, so the idea is that you can fix a choice of parameters and then um, kind of generically study the solution um, to this system and it forms an algebraic variety. And then the solution can be found by defining the ideal um, and then studying this using uh, computational algebraic geometry. So to give you kind of a, I mean, this is a baby example where you can do everything by hand, but I want to give you a concrete example of what uh, problem that we've looked at um, some years ago, where you have the biological system is um, looking at the gut and many um, of these molecules dysfunction. And one of the molecule, the pathway is called WINT. So remember I said a pathway is a set of molecules with some interactions, and it turns out there's something like 50 different hypotheses, 50 different models, so 50 different systems of equations that people study. And this is one of the models, and so you can see this is actually a very large system. There's 19 variables and 31 parameters, and uh, you can see that we're able to reduce, so we can see that the... the um, the equation that describes the change, um, the concentration of this X8 um, is equal to minus uh, X16. Um, so there's some relations as well. Um, but then we can study this, um, these polynomials in the rationals. And we're, because we're often looking at the closure because we're going to use computational um, algebraic geometry, so it's easier um, to do that, but we can then look at the steady state. So looking at where all this is equal to zero, and we're focusing on the parameters, um, which are the Ks, and the Cs, which are, um, oh, um, the Cs are also parameters, but I haven't put those in here. And then, um, then our Xs are the indeterminates, are our variables. So the steady state variety is the zero set of these polynomials. Um, and our theorem is that for gene generic uh, parameters, this steady state variety is associated to the Wnt shuttle model um, for this pathway is dimension zero, so they're points, and degree nine. 
And then we went through and found um, that you could, we found up to nine, we did find nine real zeros and up to three positive real zeros. So this has kind of um, opened up an area which is um, nice for using, for studying real algebraic geometry and trying to um, prove it or find any um, more, multi, more positive um, zeros than just the three we found. And what the really nice consequence is, is this was the first Wnt model where um, we could explain multiple uh, solutions. So that uh, can relate to different cell decisions. And that's ultimately what systems biology is trying to do is um, kind of un unpick all the nonlinearities in these large systems. Um, so then uh, kind of a lemma from this is that the if we look at these polynomials and we look at the ideal that's generated by them, um, we actually get a non-trivial decomposition, which is um, we can we have two different components, and one component we call the main component, and that component um, is um, where everything is all the solutions. Uh, sorry, where everything um, all the steady states. Um, are non-zero, and then another, which we call the extinction component, is where some of the steady states go to zero. And why that's interesting um, is, uh, it, I mean, kind of having this two different components for what's possible to happen is interesting because I don't know of any other results where in the biology where people have seen this, and in studying, for example, another biological system like the microbiome, one of the main challenges is that after fecal transplantation, the steady state, many of these um, um, desired species go to zero. So um, it might be interesting to study extinction components for other systems as well. So then I'm going to spend um, three more minutes and then we'll um, um, just stop for a second for questions. So um, there are many different directions from uh, looking at these systems. And so one, another direction is actually working with it, real experimental data and the questions that come up. And so we, um, the paper I mentioned and kind of the framework is more theoretical, but then when you want to tie it with data, there's some natural questions that come up, which is, um, does, does my model enable me or allow me to estimate the parameters? Um, and um, are there, um, um, I've already talked about the multiple state states and the identifiability question, which is can we actually estimate the parameters? Um, but everything that I've talked about here is always looking at this, the steady state data or steady state behavior. So now the second part um, um, of my talk, well, this, I mean, I mean, the main question of the talk, which I'm going to just introduce and then take a minute is trying to answer kind of the big question now that we have so much more data available. It's important to look at the systems at steady state, but then it's important to actually look at what's happening when they're not in steady state. So the question is, how does dynamics and randomness at the molecular scale give rise to order and control at the scale of the whole organism? And we're mathematicians, so what's the math that underlies it? Um, so the main objectives for the rest of the talk, these are the two things we want to do, is to infer rate constants from what's called the mech erc um, pathway from wild type dynamics. This is transient data, time course data. And the second thing we want to do is quantify the rate constant differences across the mech and erc wild type. So let me just explain what I mean about this. So we have the ERC biology, and that's what this um, initial watercolor was showing you, is this molecule 10 is MEC, and that's an enzyme that facilitates a reaction, and 11 is ERC, and that um, ERC is important for um, many different uh, systems. So the idea is you have some signal on the outside of the cell, it activates a molecule called RAF, which then activates, and that's what these P's are, is uh, modifying it, called MEC, and then again, it double modifies ERC. So this double modification, when ERC has no 
uh, modification, we have it called S0. And then when it has one modification, it's called S1. And when it has two, it's called S2. And that's substrate. And then you get a response. So now, the experimental setup sounds very simple, but actually it's quite challenging to do this with the wild type, which is the normal um, unmodified mech. And this is because the enzyme has to be activated and we're having it activated naturally, which means like what we have here, it's activated higher up in the pathway. Oh, and the most important, important part, why we should care about this is that um, MEC and dysfunctions in this ERK pathway are involved, these dysfunctions are involved with 75 different cancers and 14 different developmental, so these are vasopathies. So there are so many, I work with five different pharmaceutical companies and all of them care about this pathway, right? So this is a major um, target for, for pathways. Okay, so this simple example, this simple reaction is actually very difficult to do because um, the Schwarzman lab had to activate MEC in some way and they activate it naturally, not using some modification or um, mutation, which is what many experimentalists will do because it's hard enough, okay? So you have the enzyme and your substrate. And they add some energy and they put it in a test tube. And then you see these gels. And so what this shows is that your ERK is not modified at time zero. And then it's singly modified. As you can see, it's singly modified as time goes through. And then it becomes doubly modified. And then they put this through like image J or some processing and uh, they get out um, the concentration of uh, S0, oh, 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 whoops. S0 at these different time points, S1 at these seven time points and S2 at these seven time points and they have 12 replicates. And so that's wild type, that's healthy and they've activated it in a very natural and a normal and like the healthy way. Now some many groups and many labs, because it's so difficult to do this, they actually activate it through change, this is an activation loop and they do a slight modification. So then MEC is just active. And if MEC is active, then it can always, um, it's always on so it can activate ERK. Okay, so when with this, um, that is kind of the normal, um, this is the what they would often call like a wild type ERK. I'm not calling that wild type ERK because it is a mutation, but it's like a mutagenic mutation. Okay, so then there's other mutations. This orange, this E203, is involved in cancer mutations. And then this F53 is involved with uh, developmental mutations. And Y130 is both. And this was all the, the genetics and modifications were done by um, Martin Wurzlaff. So now the remainder of my talk, and this is where I'm going to stop, is the rest of my talk I'm going to build on what we've just discussed, which is how do we construct a model from chemical reactions? And this is the ERK model that we're going to look at. And then how do we approximately reduce the model? How do we exactly reduce the model? trying to infer the parameters, and how does that relate to a notion called sloppiness, which is very um, prevalent in the computational biology literature and biophysics. And what we show is that it's actually um, kind of unpicking is we're going to determine whether the model is structurally identifiable and determine whether it's practically identifiable. Ultimately, we want um, um, these rate constants, these parameter values, and then we would like to quantify the differences in the posterior distributions of the parameters with of the wild type and the mutations. Okay, so um, break there. Are there any questions? If you have a question, please unmute and ask. So you're going to be using algebra geometric methods to solve these problems, Heather? Or exactly, yes. Okay, so we get to see what role algebraic geometry plays in this. And some topology, so it's not a 
Yeah. Oh, good. Good. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so there's so, there's a little bit of something for everyone. Yeah. Okay. Great. Good. So so jumping right in. Um. The way that we've approached this problem is not necessarily the way that many um, um, computational biologists or um, experimentalists approach the problem. But let me just uh, refresh. We looked at these systems of chemical reactions, and we've translated them into systems of polynomial equations. So these are the actual reactions. So it's a very small system because of what I showed you with the test tube, right? There's the enzyme and the substrate, so this is MEC and ERC, and then we have the assumption that there's some reaction rate KF1 that forms what's called an intermediate complex, and then this modifies, and and this um, the modification, so they bind in C1, and then it passes this modification over to C2. Now either we can unbind, and so then we have that E plus S1, or we it can stay bound, and it doesn't unbind, it stays bound, and then you have E plus S2. So this is the experimental, um, um, I wouldn't even say hypothesis, because it's pretty well established that this would be the chemical reaction network. And then the corresponding um, ODEs, I would normally put X, lowercase, all of this, but because um, I also want this to be um, uh, corresponding to what, what we've worked on um, with the experimentalists is uh, that we have these ODEs that are capital letters, but we would normally have, have them, them lowercase. So, so yes, so we have um, six, a coupled system of six ODEs, and we have six parameter values. We also have what are called conservation relations, which is that the total enzyme is conserved. So that is E, but then when E is bound with S0, that's C1 and C2. And then we have conservation of the total substrate. And that's our ERC, and that means that we have S0, which is kind of the initial amount of ERC, which nothing is modified, but then plus C1, plus C2, plus S1 plus S2. Okay, so those are our system of equations. So now the first um, thing is talking about approximate reduction. And I guess maybe I'll, I'll pause and just um, emphasize that with this system of equations, the experimentals that we're working with uh, really likes math and is happy to have, look at ODE equations. And what they often will do is take this system of equations and put it into MATLAB, put their data in, and they put F min solve or something like this, and you get out values for parameters. And that would be the end of the story, and that's what they do. But um, Stas is in engineering, and he said, well, we know that some of the reactions happen faster than others, so we can have a quasi-steady state assumption. And actually, we teach quasi-steady state assumptions, um, quasi-steady state analysis here. So, I, so, I, so we started looking at it and I was like, well, it depends on when he described it and when I was thinking about how we've taught it and things didn't seem to quite be the same. And so I started looking into this and I was like, okay, um, there's this uh, nice paper by Goke and Walter from uh, 2017. And they say, a precise mathematical description and analysis of quasi-steady state analysis was only achieved in the 1980s. And I'm familiar with the paper they were talking about. Some aspects are still not completely resolved. The issue is complicated by the fact that different groups of scientists, including different groups of mathematicians, have different notions of and different approaches to quasi-steady state assumptions and reductions. So I was like, okay, I'm not the only one that gets confused about this. I guess that's um, reassuring. And then it should be, you know, emphasized that the choice of this quasi-steady state critically influences its translation to mathematical terms, which would explain why we were getting different things and different notions in the literature. So that um, if you've ever come across quasi-steady state, then there's this very nice paper that was published a couple of years ago, and we were at the same time also looking at this. And um, I guess in the process, there's been many different algebraic um, um, analyses of studying quasi-steady state approximations. 
Um, and so one, one problem is whether there's actually a way to solve the solvability and when it's not solvable, when you um, cannot actually use this quasi-statistic assumption. And there's more using algebraic varieties to um, study the polynomials and when it's not solvable. There's another, um, uh, Sweeney put, has a paper where they give conditions and the graph structure so that you can actually perform this analysis. And then Elisenda and co-authors gave necessary and sufficient conditions for when this agrees with a standard singular perturbation reduction. Um, and it, you can put it in what's called Tikhonov standard form. And this is um, asymptotics, and it turns out our model is very nice. And so um, we've used um, this algebraic way rather than, I don't want to say ad hoc, but more rather than um, kind of an ad hoc way. So the idea is just what the experimentalist says is they put in less total enzyme than substrate, and therefore they know the, that certain reactions are happening. Um, and so you can assume that C1 and C2 are at steady state. And then they can do this elimination, and we reduce the model into a system of three um, ODEs, which is dependent on five parameters. And then on top of that, it turns out experimentally in the literature, uh, the rate constants have been some of them, the ratios of some of them are known. And so um, we know that this denominator is very, very um, it's, it's close to one, so we can basically just use the numerator, which reduces the model even more. So we then can, instead of having a quasi-state assumption, we can use a linear model. Now, I was a bit skeptical about this, so we've actually done quite a bit of analysis, which I won't bother you with, but um, to make sure that the quasi-steady state versus the linear um, is, is sound. And even with, without, that without that information, um, we can reduce it. So now let me just stop for a second. Once we've talked about reducing the model approximately, saying we think certain reactions are happening faster and we know differences in the initial amounts of um, enzyme and substrate, the next thing is looking at, um, uh, instead of uh, the approximate, is looking at exact. The way to do exact uh, reduction is often called non-dimensionalization, and this is in the seminal paper that um, from the 80s of Siegel and Slumrod is um, the art of choosing uh, suitable dimensionless variables. That's where this exact non-dimensionalization. So uh, the idea here, uh, perhaps some of you have come across it, is that there's a Buckingham Pi theorem, and it states that if there are n physical variables and parameters, each expressed in terms of some combination of m fundamental units, it's possible to express the system in terms of n minus m non-dimensional quantities. So what one really gets is a fundamental set of invariants, and these are obtained from um, computing the basis of the null space of a matrix of exponents. And I'm going to explain this in just a second. But when I was teaching in the math bio course, I'm sorry, this is a very big, I will just next time write only the equations, but this is a, a problem sheet. This is a homework problem, is you take these system of equations, which are very similar to the ones we're analyzing, but only two. And this is a substrate and an intermediate and an enzyme. And they say, um, please use this substitution to non-dimensionalize. So the idea with non-dimensionalization is um, if you think about time, right? You want to take the time out of this non-dimensionalization. So uh, the non-dimensionalization is scaling, right? So, um, and when you're scaling time, um, these scalings form a class of group actions. And so as I was teaching, I was thinking, well, this, this seems rather than do ad hoc and we take some substitutions of what are effectively invariants, um, here, there, and then and substitute in to then get a simpler system. Uh, as I started thinking about it, it turns out that um, Evelyn Hubert and George Laban have thought about scaling invariance and symmetry reduction of dynamical systems, and these scalings form a class of group actions, and um, the invariance gives uh, 
these quantities that we were showing you. So you get these invariants um, that obey the underlying model structure. And so I, I thought, okay, it would be really nice if we create a software that can actually implement some of these ideas that are really beautifully written um, and just the beautiful ideas in this paper um, and actually make it so mathematical biologists could use it. And so um, uh, Richard Tambor worked with me on this um, with Emily over um, kind of um, a couple years ago. And then he's left, he's gone to Google, and so I wasn't sure if we should continue it. And then uh, last year, there was a paper where um, in Scion Review, they go through a complete theory of dimensional and scaling analysis with this vector matrix um, exponent. And this author seems to be doing everything except not realizing it's um, that, that uh, he's looking at uh, maximal scaling um, symmetry. So, um, right, so then let me just give an overview. As we take this input system I showed you, and uh, it turns out you can do all of this. Is, it's, it's all um, linear algebra over the integer. So uh, we have some variable order. We get an exponent matrix of um, each of the terms in our, our model, and we get a, uh, an exponent matrix for each of, these, um, each of these equations. We calculate the scaling, and then we actually can see in this um, matrix what's the time and what's um, the concentration. So we get these, um, yeah, we get these scalings, and then we can um, put this into Hermite form, and we get the, these invariants, which are, um, is non-dimensionalizations, and then we can substitute this in and non-dimensionalize it. And so depending on, there's many different non-dimensionalizations, right? Um, but it's nice because it's actually um, a lot of, of algebra under the hood. And so we're, um, oh, I had. So we're um, in the process. I thought actually we'd have, we have the um, software and the paper, and I thought we'd have it done for the talk today, but um, I don't have it out, but it should be done. And, I mean, it's. It's basically there. So, so that's very exciting um, that we can do linear algebra over the uh, integers and um, kind of uh, provide instead of an ad hoc way of doing non-dimensionalization and actually solve for um, some of these more, solve some of the math bio um, questions for larger systems as well. Okay, so I've talked about reduction and two different ways, quasi steady state reduction and then exact reduction. And I said, okay, great. We're going to use this exact non-dimensionalization, and I thought, hold on, our data is dimensional. So I've kind of gone on a little bit of a tangent because with our model, with the linear model, for example, we won't actually use this non-dimensionalization because we want to estimate the, the, the dimensions, the dimensional quantities. What we can do is write out the analytic solution to our linear system of ODEs. Then we're left with a, a simplified model, this S0, S1, and S2. And um, that pi is not actually pi. It's a, it's a, a parameter that the experimentalist likes. And that gives a measure of what they call processivity. And that's one type of biological mechanism. OK, so now um, there is. So we've talked about model reduction, and now we want to estimate the parameters from our reduced model. And so there's this uh, idea in the biophysics community, um, which is, was introduced by um, Jim Sethna and Mark Transtrom, and the co-authors of sloppiness. And the idea is that all models are universally sloppy. And I was trying to get an idea, and they, you know, in their work, it quantifies the geometric um, uncertainty in the parameter estimation problem. I said, well, we're estimating parameters that would be very relevant to understand. And they do this via the Fisher information matrix. And so um, some years ago, we got into this and started looking at what is sloppiness. And um, I don't have the number of citations here, but there are a lot of people looking at sloppy um, saying, you know, sloppy parameters. And the idea is that certain parameters, you can change orders of magnitude the value, and it doesn't change, um, it doesn't, it, it, that still will very well fit your data. And so what, what we did was um, 
we kind of redefine sloppiness um, conceptually in a mathematical way as a comparison between the pre-metric on your parameter space that's induced by the measurement noise in your data and a reference metric on the parameter space. So we're going from, uh, yeah, so, so to do this, what we realized is that uh, it actually, sloppiness is actually kind of a combination of what's called structural identifiability and what's called practical identifiability. And the identifiability problem can be reformulated as a question about fibers of a map um, that send parameter values and initial conditions of, say, an ODE data to output data that function uh, that that are functions of the corresponding solution. Um, so the setup is that we have a mathematical model, and just for now, think about our mathematical model as our system of ODEs, but we did it a bit more generally, and we have perfect data. So um, I'll define perfect data in just a second. So we have X are the variables, and our model depends on P parameters, which are like the rate constants, but we can measure Y, and we have some perfect data. The parameter estimation problem is to estimate the parameter P from real noisy um, data. Okay, so then how sloppiness and identifiability goes down is that we're really looking at an equivalence relation on our parameter space. So we have our model, it depends on our variable, our parameter, and we have measurable output, what we can measure, and our data. So two parameters, P and P prime, are equivalent if and only if P and P prime produce the same perfect data. For us, that is the value of our measurable output of our concentrations of our species at some or all time. So in the sloppiness literature, the example is always looking at the sum of exponentials. So um, here, the sum of exponentials is e to the minus at plus e to the minus bt. So it's, it's very obvious looking at this that um, our model, um, equivalence relation on our model, we can think of a, b, and t getting sent to this, and we have some perfect measurements. And so then we can see that our equivalence relation is AB is equivalent to BA. Therefore, the equivalence classes are AB, BA, and AA, if, if A is equal to B. Right, and so then we can kind of see a stratification of the parameter space. So the next thing that's very prevalent in, in the sloppiness literature is what's called a model prediction map. And we've defined this, it's a function that sends your parameters um, to, to your data. So, and that gives you your perfect data. Um, and then we call this the model predictions. And that's a function of the parameter space. Of the, uh, sorry, it's a function of the parameters and that factors through this set theoretic quotient and is injective on all the equivalence classes. So, So then the existence of a model prediction maps means that we can actually identify, right, so that we can take this perfect data produced by the parameter P and it can be identified with a point of Rn for some n. So we're trying to make this equivalence relation effective. So I'll give, um, so oh, this is a remark, but in the sloppiness literature, the image of a model prediction map is called a model manifold, but it's not always a, mod a manifold. So that's just a remark that for some time I was trying to figure out how it's a manifold and it doesn't have to be in general. So this is kind of what you should have in your mind is that you have um, some parameters and then you have this model prediction map that goes to your, um, your perfect data. And, this mod uh, and then it needs to be injected. Okay, so now some examples. So we have, let's say, our model prediction map for the sum of exponentials at time points t1, third, 1, and 3. 
then we can see that AB goes to, you know, we just substitute in the T's. And we can see this is another model prediction map. But then what we can also see is that we have AB going to A plus B and AB, then we're not able to, um, we're not able to, to make this equivalence relation um, um, effective, right? So you're not able to identify this. So now the next question is, once we're able to say, okay, do we have a model prediction map? Can we test it in some way? How many data points do we actually need? And there's a nice um, theorem by Eduardo Sontag that says if you have R parameters, then you need two R, at least two R plus one experiments. Now in our, um, uh, our, our experience, you actually don't always need two R plus one, but that is the theorem there. Then for structural identifiability, right, the whole idea is that if we have perfect data, can we recover the parameters? And another way we can say a model is structurally identifiable, oops, sorry, is if there is a subset W of non-zero measure in your parameter space such that any parameter P in the subset can be uniquely determined from the trajectories of your output without, so with perfect data. So we can, we can kind of describe um, the whole um, sloppiness. I'm only right now still talk talking about the structural identifiability, but then ultimately what we want to do is also tell, say, can we do something practically? Can we estimate the parameters even if there's noise? So we're still up here in this diagram. And so why I'm going down this road, it turns out that there's a nice way that we can test this. And this is using computational differential algebra. And for the special class of, of models, which are our rational ODE models, we can use um, Ritt and Colchin's theory of differential algebra. So it turns out that we can actually describe the equivalence classes of these ODE models using something called exhaustive summaries. And that's a collection of functions that makes this equivalence relation effective, which is super cool and so nice that we're able to do this. So I hope I'm convincing you that like, we've now gone and from what I thought was there's no way we're going to be able to understand what sloppiness is to okay now we can start to to you know um, pull it apart and that the first level or layer is structural identifiability how do we test these equivalence classes I was like oh no how are we going to do this it turns out for the special class of models which we have here there's we can find these exhaustive summaries and there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the solutions of our ODE system and the radical differential ideals so we can say that two parameter values, P and P prime, give the same tra trajectory if they yield the same differential ideal. And we can compute this using a characteristic set. And I'm gonna, um, that's a special basis for an ideal. And so the idea is you have um, something that's kind of upper triangular and this um, for, for the, this differential ideal. And the computations um, from, from, from doing the characteristic set, you can compute what's called an input-output equation. And this is what the whole thing is that, um, that describes input-output equation of the model and uh, consists of a rational map from your parameter space to some Rn. And we can test if this map is injective using grosvenor basis. And if it is, then it, the model's identifiable. And all of this has been implemented um, in a software called DAISY. So now, um, in the interest of time, I was going to go through an example where we have a system of a system of reactions, which gives a system of, um, of, of ODEs, and we can write this as a nice linear system. And from this, we can write our input-output equation, and then we test whether or not the, this coefficient map is one-to-one, -one, and this is the coefficient map, and it's not. So we can also test this for example, uh, computing the input output equations of a simpler model uh, than what the one is, the ERC one that we're looking at. And it is globally identifiable. We can use uh, in Maple, there's a way to do this differential algebra elimination in Rosen Rosenfeld Grobner. And so this is just what it would look like. And this is how it looks, right? So it turns out very quickly, it's a bit of a mess. But as I was saying, we can test the full and the linear model using um, DAISY. And, um, and we find that both are ident structurally identified.
So now the next thing is practical identifiability. Can we estimate the values if the data is noisy? Okay, so now if we have uh, noisy data and we have assumed that there's additive Gaussian noise, then we can look at this um, model prediction map. So we have the, the data as mean as the analytic solution in our case, right? And, and then we have um, this probability density function and it induces a pre-metric by the callback Lagler divergence. And I'm gonna go very quickly through this, but the idea is that we can say, now we have a definition, a mathematical model is sloppy at P0, so at some um, point. If in a neighborhood around this, the pre-metric D diverges significantly from the reference metric DP on parameter space. And there's very nice ways to do this when you're working in, um, for Euclidean and Gaussian noise, and that's why uh, the Fisher information matrix, we can look at the eigenvalues and the condition number, and that gives you um, a notion of this. But then if we want to think of level sets of D at this parameter P, then what we're looking at is the level sets. And as we consider the level sets, the first level set is the equivalence class of P. So that tells us the structural identifiability. The other level sets tell us the sloppiness, kind of the practical identifiability. I don't have all the uh, details here because I'll run out of time, but it's really talking about the boundedness. And so that's kind of the work that we've been doing um, in that direction. So the thing to take home is that we can look at different parameter values, and it turns out that sloppiness, this idea of, of um, is different at different points in the parameter space. Um, and then we can also look at different time points for uh, the sum of exponential example. And again, it's a local property. So now we looked at our um, ERC model, and we looked at um, the level sets. I can't remember now what um, this is, but we can very clearly see, uh, if I were to rotate it, that the wild type, which is this orange, and the other ones are structurally, as well as we've already tested that, is, are also practically identifiable, each of these potatoes. And this is in the kind of P1, P2, P3 parameter space. Um, okay. So now I'm going to um, jump through. We do some parameter inference, and we use Bayesian inference, and we set up uh, the priors based on what the experimentalists have said. And then we infer the parameters, and for the three parameters, um, we have very nice fits to the time, time course data, with our, our linear model. And we have uh, each of these seem to look very nice um, uh, for the posterior distributions. But often what, we, uh, what happens is people don't think about the whole uh, multidimensional density here, this whole, uh, the, distribu the posterior distribution. They will project, which is what we're kind of seeing here, is a projection. Um, and this is all uh, with the wild type. And the experimentalist is very happy that we were able to show that this posterior looks um, very nice and they could interpret this. And we do this not just for um, the wild type, but also for the different mutants. So they have data and time course data for each of those. And so the gray is the wild type. And then this is the figure that shows up in our paper that I think is published this week. Um, and this is... Uh, looking at the difference. So visually, in each of the parameter value, each of the parameters like P1, P2, P3, how is this, how is the mutant kinetics different than the wild type kinetics? And this is actually how they look at everything in slices and projections, right? Uh, and one way to compute um, kind of the similarity of, or kind of a distance but it's not really, is using callback Leibler divergence between um, these uh, posterior distributions. And we can get a table, and we find that the, the one that is furthest away from the wild type is this E203 mutation, that E203 is involved in cancer. And then the next one is this FS53, um, and then Y130 are very similar. Oh, and the, uh, sorry, the second one is this SSDD which is, remember, what many experimentalists use. But in our paper, the first, the biological paper, we didn't emphasize any of that. We emphasized, we just said that the E203 is very different from the wild type, the most different. 
it turns out that the mutations we've been looking at that I mentioned are involved in development and cancer in humans, in fruit flies, which is Stas's lab, are very involved with mutations in these mutations in MEK are involved in mutations in, in the fruit fly wing. And they can give some uh, measure of how um, different or mutated the fruit fly wing is. I don't quite understand this. But it turns out the one that's for the largest difference in the way the fruit fly wing is the E203, and then the Y130 and, and F, these, these two mutants, and then the wild type is a very small. Um, so I thought that was also very nice. Now I can't tell you what if there there must not be a mutant. I don't know for the SSDD because that is kind of the what most people use as a normal. Okay. So in my last five minutes, I'm gonna now say, well, we've looked at these posterior distributions. We have these samples from our posterior distributions in the parameter space, and these colors aren't don't match the other colors. I'm sorry. Um, but this is what they kind of look like. And then if we were to rotate it, I said, can we say something more about the shape of these? And it turns out there's some really nice work um, from Omar, Cheyenne, and Jonathan. And what they have there is this topological consistency um, by a kernel um, estimation. So um, the question here is we take the posterior distribution, which is in the form of samples, right? It's points from from the posterior distribution. And then we look at, um, we use a KDE, and so we get some um, parameter R or H, which ends up being, it's a good kernel density estimate, um, kernel density estimator um, estimation of the R, R posteriors. And then we use a super level set uh, filtration. So we can construct a simplicial complex from these samples and we filter um, using this uh, kernel density estimate. And so, um, right, so we kind of uh, use two results. So the first one is from Omer, and then the second one um, is work from the bottleneck distance um, from Chazal for significance. So um, T uh, persistent homology in a slide is you start with some, some data and you filter it in some way, you compute um, homology, and then we have a way to visualize it in the, in the form of barcodes or persistence diagrams. What we're able to do is do this super level set filtration, and we get a um, resulting barcode for each of our posterior distributions um, corresponding to our wild type, and then each of the mutations. And we can compute distances between diagrams. Um, I think this is from Ali Bauer. I, oh, I uh, need to clean that. So, but uh, we get a bottleneck distance, and then we now we can compare distributions of, of shapes. And what we find is actually that the SSDD, uh, oh, the SSDD, which is uh, this, it seems to be that one is the, has the, is most different in shape. And that's interesting because maybe this means that when we're quantifying um, kind of the uncertainty and what the possible parameters that can describe this is very different for what almost all the experimentalists use when they use MEC, this constitutively activated MEC. And so uh, that's a question if we're doing in vivo and in vitro experiments, right? What can we say about what we do in a test tube if we modified it a little bit to then in the real living system if if the um, if the kinetics are, are the the shape of those is very different. Okay, so then um, I wanted to also say that today I've talked about always one single signaling pathway. First, I talked about the Wnt signaling pathway, and then I talked about um, the ERK MEC signaling pathway. But actually, which is this one? So they call it RAS, but I mean this is the but then there are crosstalk. There's when multiple pathways interact. And so um, we've been proving theorems about what properties hold, identifiability, multi-stability, when you're looking at crosstalk, multiple pathways. And then a lot of this, right, we can think about looking at this at, um, um, for different types of cells. So we can kind of scale up. This is uh, the uh, 
the, the large network of, of human cancers. And so you can think of groups of cells. And um, we've been spending a lot of time looking at um, kind of tissues and vascular networks and how that uh, is involved in, um, in disease. So I hope I've uh, given you a flavor for many different ways you can use algebraic geometry. I didn't talk about much of the matroids work today. Uh, very much uh, related because no data has noise and so we need statistics. And underlying all of this is a lot of dynamical systems. What are the possible behaviors? And what I think really is nice is that at the core of it with uh, the algebra, we're using you know, optimization, linear algebra, differential algebra. And so just to summarize, we started with a hypothesis and created a mathematical model. Then we've analyzed it with some model reduction, looking at multiple steady states, writing a discriminant, and then what are the, what's the data that we need? And actually, um, it took many years going through before uh, we could, with, with the collaborators in Princeton, actually be able to compare our models and our data. So I've talked about a few of these things. But I think it's really nice we're able to close the cycle. And I see many different directions for um, how TDA can be um, very useful in kind of unpicking and, um, and helping um, uh, yeah, this nonlinear mess in, uh, in systems biology. So on that, um, I'll thank you for your So I open the floor to questions. If anybody from the audience would like to ask a question, unmute yourself and feel free to ask. Yeah, I can I sort of get now. things. Sorry, yes? Yeah, so I have a question. Yeah. Oh, do it, sorry. Yeah? Yeah, I have a very nice talk. I, I'm glad to know there's an exact definition for sloppiness. I can apply it to my own life. But uh, um, <laughs> it was a joke. Hey, look, so the question was experimentally, you sort of did some, or it was possible to do dimension reduction by reducing the amount of uh, enzyme versus the amount of substrate. So what they, the thing is that this is a really nicely controlled experiment, right? So because they're just doing everything with a test tube, they know exactly how much enzyme right. they're putting in and exactly how much substrate. Because there's so much that's known, the system ends up being really nicely studied. And similarly, they have values for what's called KM, so this michaelis menten constant. They have values that are known that many other people have kind of um, experimentally verified. So we weren't able to just from that information find out what the parameter values would be right but um we were able to put this in to then uh, infer how it then to provide how to reduce the model more is it also possible to change the type of atp to change the turnover rate i mean these are done in other experiments uh, i don't know um, that's a very good question i remember we went down this uh actually Stas was in my office and then we kind of were going from board to board, and I think it was a bit, um, I don't know. I think one of the reviewers may have said something, and so they did more experiments with, um, I'd have to actually have to look. I was going to say, I'll look it up while I was talking to you, but you can see my screen. Because I remember they did quite a few more experiments looking at different things with ATP. Yeah, yeah. But I can't tell you exactly. OK. I think we assume that there's plenty of ATP for that. That's not a limiting thing. Yeah. And we had to okay. show this. And so. Any other questions from the audience? I was wondering, Heather, uh, given that at the very end you were talking about using TDA methods and uh, looking at barcodes and using that to sort of quantify the, the differences between these different distributions. I was wondering um, whether you could also apply this in kind of an unsupervised manner if you had the data from experiment where you weren't sure maybe even of what the uh, underlying system of ODEs or something like that, whether you could also uh, say, is this like one of these other systems that I'm considering? You could sort of try to quantify the, uh, determine, try to figure out what mutation was involved by figuring out where, what it was closer to, something like that? Right, so what you're asking, I think, is kind of two different questions. And the first one is, let's suppose yeah. 
you give me data, a time course data, or many replicates, which is what we have, right? So that was the nice thing. We have many replicates. Suppose you give me many replicates. Does that, is that replicate one of the current mutations or is it a new mutation? And that was one, of, I think that's what you're asking, right? And this is actually one of the questions that I was thinking, why don't we, why don't we try this? Why don't we, new, you know, simulate a fake mutant or have staffs give us some data? And, um, mm -hmm. and so this is something I'm really interested in. And then the, um, I mean, actually what we found is that using uh, the super level set filtration for, for studying this um, KDE, like the graph from the KDE, there's, each of these are statistically significant different, right? Like it's, that was really nice that we could test this hypothesis and, and show that. Um, so I think that's actually very nice. So I'm hoping that we're able to, to test that. Um, the second question you had was, let's suppose that you have, um, you were asking the other, almost the inverse, like another inverse problem, right? Which is, let's suppose you have some time course data. Can you then tell me what model or class of models could, could give me that? Is that correct? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so I have on and off been working on that. Um, and it turns out that you kind of need to say, well, let's, let's bound some degree. But even with perfect data, there's, uh, even if you have perfect data with no noise, there are still many models that can give you the same, um, hmm. the, the same, uh, produce the same data. Um, and then with noise, um, it's a bit difficult. We do have a result for discrete dynamical systems for being able to, to recover the, the a correct network with enough data. Um, so we've been able to prove that theorem, but, um, there aren't many examples that, I mean, and actually we can prove that even with a little bit of measurement noise. Um, but then for continuous, I really, I'm not able to have anything like, it seems like it's uh, more, more difficult. Okay, thank you very much. Any further questions? Okay, if not, let's uh, thank Heather again. Thank you very much for this lovely presentation and everyone next week. Uh, thank you for the opportunity.